part even. All right. So with that, we're going to turn it over to John. You're going to go at your own pace or you're going to go fast. You're going to go slow, but you are going to move today. All right, John, take it away. To the Emory Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Today, we're gonna turn that cardio up and we're just gonna work on those abs. Plus, you know I must work on that total body, body sculpting today. So, get ready in five seconds. We're gonna get ready to go in five, four, three, two, and one. Here we go. Create that circulation.
everybody is all revved up and we're ready to learn right now. Our speaker today is Ms. Sue Peshjan. She's president and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. It's a nonprofit organization that advances scientific and medical discoveries that have to do with health, but more importantly, it's also an advocacy organization to help advise us about what the government is covering and not covering as it relates to Alzheimer's and related dementias in terms of Medicare and Medicaid. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Sue Peshton, the CEO and president of Aging Alliance for Aging Research. Mrs. Peshton. Thank you, Dr. Parker. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and thank you to John. I was um, struggling a little bit with my coordination, but I liked it. So 
Um, thanks for the opportunity to kind of just, you know, get a little bit more relaxed before I have a conversation with all of you. And I'm so happy to be here on Brain Talk Live. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit about Medicare coverage for the new Alzheimer's therapies. And um, I am, we are a little bit ahead in the slides. If you could just go back one slide. Um, these are yeah, okay, that's the first one, terrific. And my name again is Sue Peshin with the Alliance for Aging Research. We're in Washington, DC. We've been around since 1986. And our goal is really to promote uh, research as a way to improve the experience of healthy aging for everyone. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're just gonna give kind of a brief overview of Medicare coverage. I'm going to talk about something called coverage with evidence development or CED that's become a uh, sort of a new paradigm for coverage um, by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the federal agency that runs the Medicare program. Uh, we're going to talk about the new coverage determination for the monoclonal antibody therapies. These are the FDA approved therapies. Uh, that are now, there's one in particular that has gotten full approval from the FDA called Lecambi. We're going to talk about coverage for that. Uh, we're going to talk about how this decision set sort of a new precedent for the way Medicare is going to cover new medications moving forward and potential impacts on access. And then the policy for PET scans, which uh, some of you might be familiar with, a type of, of scan that you can get that can help confirm whether or not you may have Alzheimer's disease. And then we're going to open it up for a question and answer. And please put your questions in the chat as we move along. And um, I just really appreciate you being here. So let's get started. OK, next slide. First, we're going to talk about Medicare coverage. and. Again, CMS, that's short for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They're, they're missing that M, I always say, uh, but there's CMS for short. And there's a real difference between the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services versus the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration is the federal biomedical agency that approves drugs, um, biologics, medical devices, based on whether or not they're safe and effective. They have a lot of doctors and researchers and biostatisticians that work there. They uh, have a lot of background in evidence-based regulatory science. And for the most part, CMS and the Medicare program has uh, respected the FDA's authority over what they consider to be safe and effective medical products. CMS, on the other hand, is a payer. It's like a public insurance company. And they base their coverage on what they consider to be reasonable and necessary. And while the US Congress has defined what safe and effective means, uh, they haven't really defined what reasonable and necessary means. So it may have been your experience or from people that you know that sometimes coverage is, you know, a little bit, it, it might vary. Certain things are covered, certain things aren't. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but uh, CMS has some discretionary authority and that's a little bit of what we're gonna be talking about today because um, they can take a look at uh, things that are FDA approved that you think should be covered, but they may decide that they're not reasonable and necessary if they feel that the risks for those things outweigh the benefits. Okay, next slide. So we're going to first talk about what's called a national coverage determination. And this is where our CMS sets a national coverage policy in the Medicare program. And in the last 10 years or so, they've issued a little over 330 national coverage determinations or around eight or so a year. So they don't do them for everything, but they do do them a lot of times for newer, innovative things, medical devices. For the most part, they're medical devices or other types of services. Like for example, if you're getting a stem cell replacement uh, or, uh, a cochlear implant or some type of a more sort of sophisticated newer therapy, 
they do it in part as a way to kind of slow down use, which is called utilization management, right? Because they're they're the government, they're trying to save a little bit of money and maybe kind of slow things down a bit. But that definitely has access and equity issues uh, for people who rely on the Medicare program in order to be able to get access to therapies. So when they decide to start one of these national coverage determinations, they open up what's called a national coverage analysis. And they take a look at what they see as the evidence around that medical item or service. And it takes them about nine to 12 months. And during that period of time, there's really oftentimes no Medicare coverage for what they're taking a look at. So unless you're able to pay out of pocket for that new FDA approved therapy, uh, they you're sort of in suspension until they go through their process. Um, there can also be a deference to local Medicare administrative contractors or coverage at the local level for local coverage determinations. And so you may have seen sometimes certain contractors where you might get a bill for Medicare and they're the ones that are handling your claim. Uh, those are also relatively common at CMS, just like um, uh, national coverage is. But for the most part, CMS allows those coverage determinations to be done at the local level because there are sometimes regional variations in what the different contractors will allow or won't allow. And there's pluses and minuses to that, right? Okay, next slide. So when CMS launches a national coverage analysis or decides to look at a new FDA approved product or service, like a new medical device or a new type of operation or such. Um, there's a number of different outcomes that you could see. You could see that they might say, okay, anybody who's eligible for it is able to get it. That's broad national coverage under a national coverage determination. Usually those are pretty rare. Most of the time they will put limitations on them. So they might say, you can only get this in certain types of hospitals, or you need to have certain types of doctors to be able to give you this type of treatment or procedure. No national coverage decision covered locally. I just talked about that. Coverage with evidence development, or they decide not to cover it. And that's very rare, right? Because we all pay our taxes into the Medicare program. And for patient advocacy groups and others that are trying to pay attention, uh, you know, folks that uh, notice when they have decided not to cover something, they, they raise, rightfully so, a ruckus about it. And so CMS doesn't often take the position of not covering something. But what they'll do instead, and what we're going to talk about now a little bit more, is putting these guardrails around it to make it kind of hard to be able to get access to it. Next slide, please. So it's not uncommon for the coverage decision pro process for any type of medical product to become really politicized because there's a lot of economic impacts on both public payers like the Medicare program and also private payers like private insurance companies and employers. Um, there's also economic impacts on specialists like cardiologists and neurologists and surgeons. Um, and there are impacts for national and regional medical systems and for hospitals, right? And all these folks have a say in what CMS does, and they all actively advocate to CMS for their interests. Um, so we've been working on these national coverage processes for a while because we wanna make sure that individual patients and family caregivers and you know providers that maybe don't normally have a voice through a big specialty society are heard and issues around equity and making sure there's access if you're in a rural area, if you're in a low income area, if you're in an underserved area in some other way um, that, that voices are heard and it's not just for you know, in many times the people who would otherwise be able to pay for it themselves anyway. Um, so we started to get into this with the heart valve disease issue. And heart valve disease disproportionately impacts older people. 
Uh, oftentimes you develop heart valve disease after you've had a history of a heart attack or high cholesterol or um, pad, you know, pad CAD, cardiovascular disease or peripheral artery disease. Um, it just puts your heart at structural risk of kind of wear and, wear and tear on your heart valves. And there are newer procedures now that are less invasive than having to get open heart surgery. So we got involved in these issues around that at CMS. And there were dynamics between surgeons who perform the open heart surgery and cardiologists who did the less invasive type of surgery. Um, there were, uh, you know, territory issues between hospitals, small hospitals, and the big academic hospitals. So it does get very political. And we, we are in there trying to represent who really matters. And that's the people that pay their taxes, as we all do, including the people who work for those health systems and everybody else. But instead of being on you know, the side of trying to sort of push a business interest, it's really about how can we make sure that as many people as possible are able to benefit from good medical care that the FDA has deemed to be um, safe and effective. And somebody just asked a really good question around eyeglasses and dentures. And unfortunately, I mean, there have been efforts over many years uh, for better vision Cover for vision coverage and for dental coverage. And Congress hasn't really moved on this. We have supported a bill every year uh, for the last many years uh, around these issues. And, um, uh, you know, if you want to connect with us and work with us, we would, we would love it because we agree with you. There ought to be coverage for that. Next slide. So now we're going to talk about this coverage with evidence development. Next slide. So what is coverage with evidence development? Sounds like it's overly complicated. And as we all know, a lot of times government and other institutions will create things that sound boring and overly complicated because they don't want you to pay too much attention. But coverage with evidence development is a restrictive coverage requirement on top of a national coverage determination. So it's where uh, Medicare denies coverage for something that's new out of the FDA that the FDA has approved unless Medicare beneficiaries participate in ongoing study for it. So in another clinical trial or in a data registry, a patient registry you may have heard of. Um, and those in and of themselves are not necessarily bad, but not everybody can get access to those things. And that's where the trouble hits. Um, because if you can't get access, then you don't get coverage. So in, in practice, the way that we've come to see these special designations are that they're really like ways to, utilize, to, to manage access to new products and services to save the Medicare program money. And you could argue that in and of itself, you know, you want to have the Medicare program available, right, for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren but it also ought to be available for the people who need it now. And truth be told, you know, our taxes cover what's needed. We've had a lot of people get older over, you know, since 2011, when the baby boom generation started to hit 65, and it's going to continue for a while. And we argue that we need to look at a way to raise all boats rather than thinking about ways to slash and burn. We want to try to figure out how can we get more access rather than restricting access. Okay, next slide. Um, the rationale for, uh, from CMS's perspective in terms of when they apply coverage with evidence development is when CMS says that they're not reasonable and necessary, and again, I, that's a little squishy uh, because it's not in federal statute anywhere, um, they, uh, they uh, say that um, they're likely to show benefit for Medicare and the Medicare population, but that the evidence base they have so far is not persuasive uh, to provide the same type of coverage they would for something that they might just leave alone and let folks handle at the local level. And like I said before, these are usually innovative new technologies. They might be on the pricier side, and we're going to go through and I'll show you the examples of them. And they'll say that the purpose of these is to collect enough evidence to allow 
for a future reconsideration and a future assessment to hopefully widen coverage. And um, like I mentioned before, beneficiaries don't have any coverage until a study is open and patients start to get enrolled in this. So implementation can be a little bit challenging and it's not for every small rural hospital or you know, kind of non-wealthy health center to be able to implement. Next slide. There are currently 22 active coverage determinations uh, that require this coverage with evidence development. And as you can see, a bunch of them are stem cell transplants. Some of them are for cancer. One of them is for sickle cell. Uh, there's the amyloid PET, which some of you may know about, the scanning for Alzheimer's. Uh, there's uh, cochlear implants, as I mentioned, for hearing loss. Um, there are, and then you see towards the, the bottom of that first column, the monoclonal antibody therapies, those are the new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Um, you see some other items here too. There's a lot of stuff in the cardiovascular space. And I had mentioned the aortic valve replacement or the um, uh, heart valve disease, and that's in the second column there. Also TENS you might've heard about for back pain management. So there's 22, there's not a whole bunch of these, but they do use them for things that they are trying to control costs for and trying to control utilization around. The original intent of these, by the way, um, was to try to get medical devices in particular out into public use a little bit earlier. Medical device trials tend to be a bit shorter and there was agreement between the FDA and CMS at the start of CED that this might help get things out for at least some people to start using them a little bit earlier. But things have changed a little bit over time, and CMS has kind of been dragging out these studies, and we're going to talk about this. So there was one study that was published that showed that between a 2005 and 2022, uh, CMS issued a total of 27 of these types of decisions, and in 17 years, they've only retired four of them. And these, the types of studies that are involved here might just involve anywhere from tens of like 40 to 50 people in the case of some of the stem cell replacement types of treatments uh, to in the thousands, but not necessarily you know, really only a small fraction of Medicare beneficiaries that might suffer from a particular condition or might be able to benefit from the type of treatment that is being offered. Okay, next slide. Now we're, ooh, I'm sorry, I was one behind. So one more, that's where I showed you, the where I just talked about that statistic. And you'll get a copy of these slides afterwards. Okay, next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about the CED policy on the new FDA approved therapies for Alzheimer's disease. This have a very long name, monoclonal antibody therapies targeting amyloid, which I'm sure you guys have heard about if you participate in these calls. Those are those clumps of protein that build up in the brain uh, of people with Alzheimer's disease or sticky clumps. Um, next slide, please. So in April of 2022, so a little over a year and a half ago, about a year and a half ago, uh, CMS issued a coverage decision for the whole class. So it was based on one drug you might have heard of called Aduhelm uh, that the FDA had approved through accelerated approval, but they applied this decision that they made to the whole class. So even drugs that had not gotten approval yet Basically, here's this current drug and then any ones that come in the future, this is going to apply to all of them, which we're not big fans of because we think that these should be treated one, one drug at a time, right? Uh, so they what they created for these is two different pathways, depending on how the FDA approved the drug. There's a type of approval that FDA uh, is authorized by Congress to have called accelerated approval. And they are only able to use that in certain situations, um, uh, which include when it's a life-threatening illness, when patients either have no disease-modifying or 
uh, you know, uh, any type of treatment option available or they've run out of treatment options. So for example, in advanced cancers, when maybe people have had multiple types of therapy, there's no more new therapies available for them. If a new therapy is going through that process, then they might be able to get accelerated approval. And they also base the approval on a different type of endpoint where there's a suggestion that it will be clinically meaningful, but it's not a direct measure of clinical meaningfulness. So an example of that is tumor size in cancer. That's often used in accelerated approval of cancer drugs. If you can make the tumor smaller, but making the tumor smaller doesn't always translate to a longer life or reduce sickness for the individual, right? So they have to do an additional trial to confirm whether or not the drug is really working. That's accelerated approval. And the idea behind it is people with rare diseases, people who have terminal cancers, people with Alzheimer's disease, um, they don't have time on their side. And so if you can shorten that approval process, even by six months, which is generally what the average is, there's not a huge amount of difference between accelerated approval and what's known as traditional approval. Sometimes it's a couple of years. Most of the time, not so much. It's usually a matter of months. Um, then you can apply for that accelerated approval as a company that's making a new therapy. So there's that. And then there's traditional approval or what's known as full approval. And what CMS did is they put a line down that, which is very unusual. They had never done that before. And they made a difference. They sort of gave the message that if it goes through accelerated approval, maybe they don't really consider it the same as regular approval. But from congressional perspective and, and from FDA's perspective, it is. It's simply the difference is to be able to get it out a bit faster. There are requirements that are important that, that the companies live up to, and Congress gave the FDA some increased authority over the last year to be able to make sure that the companies make good and do those final uh, trials to confirm that what they say the drug is doing is what it's really doing. But families, patients are willing to take a little bit more risk because they have these types of terminal illnesses. And that trade-off is considered by FDA to be worth the risk. Um, and that, so what CMS did is they said, for these Alzheimer's therapies that are approved through the accelerated approval process, Medicare beneficiaries have to get into a randomized controlled clinical trial. That's a clinical trial that has a placebo. So even though the drug is approved by the FDA, you still might be subject to a placebo in Medicare, which is very unusual. And this was the first time they had already, they had ever done this. There would also have been a, a limited number of sites. None of the companies have really taken CMS up on this, which is why none of the therapies were getting coverage when they were under accelerated approval. The newest drug, Lakembi, which you may have heard about in the press, received traditional approval. Uh, they had gotten accelerated approval in January of this year, early January 6th of this year. And then in July, they received traditional approval. And usually, like I said, um, uh, to, oh, thank you, Crystal. Um, usually, like I said to uh, before, um, most things that go through the FDA receive coverage by Medicare, especially drugs, um, when they've gotten that coverage, uh, when they've gotten that approval through the FDA, especially full, full traditional approval. This was very unusual. The CMS put a line in the sand and said, we're still going to make people enter into studies. There'll be slightly different types of studies. There'll be what's called perspective comparative studies. In other words, we're sort of looking towards the future. We're going to follow folks who get these. You still have to get into a study. And the data could be collected in a patient registry. But 
they still limit the types of sites and they put other types of coverage restrictions around it in terms of the teams of clinicians that have to be involved and all of that. So there's still limitations and we're going to get into this a little, just a little bit more deeply. I'm just showing this to you as an example and you can see um, uh, the um, nerdy stuff that I work on on a daily basis. But this is this is important stuff and the government does this with these policies. So it's good for you all to know. Again, like I mentioned before, this applies to all the drugs in the class. So from when new therapies are approved by FDA, even though the decision was based on that adjuhelm drug, it'll, it will apply to the new drugs. And there is one more of these therapies that's expected to be approved by the FDA by the end of the year. Okay, next slide. Um, so you can you can take a look at this. This is exact language from the agency. I'm not going to go too deeply into this. Um, they talk here about diversity and representativeness. You know, a lot of times clinical trials uh, can uh, not be diverse or not be representative of uh, individuals who are living with the actual condition that's being studied, and that needs to be fixed and. And, and advocacy groups like mine and many others have taken steps to push Congress, to push FDA, uh, to make sure that clinical trials are going to gradually, you know, be, be becoming more diverse. Um, uh, and uh, so what CMS is saying is we want our studies to have this representativeness and diversity. Seems like a good thing. Um, they talk about an evaluation, making sure that you actually have mild cognitive impairment or early uh, dementia that's due to Alzheimer's disease to get into the study. And then they talk about a multidisciplinary dementia team and optimal medical management. They don't really define what these things are, though, so that's important to think about. And then study sites that have a certain type of expertise and in infrastructure. Again, they don't really define that. So that's also, it's sort of an open question. It's a little bit of how they roll. Um, so next slide. And then they ask these questions and they say the studies that you design have to be able to answer these questions to show clinical benefit and they want to make sure that you're improving health outcomes in broad community practice. And they don't really define what that exactly means. And then in terms of benefits and harms, and you may have heard about ARIA, that's been in the press regarding this class of drugs, and how do benefits and harms change over time. So these are very broad sort of strokes over what they're looking for, but it gives you an idea of what this looks like. Now, CMS set up its own registry in this case. Um, very, very interesting, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, next slide. So I've already gotten into this a little bit about how the Alzheimer's disease decision um, set a new precedent. Uh, I am just looking at the first question here. Do those doing the studies going to less well? medically covered is that I think that's what um it's a really good question uh not necessarily is the answer um it's not a qualification that they look at groups necessarily by um uh by ability to pay or by type of coverage um, it's more they're looking for diversity by race and ethnicity, I would say. Okay. Um, all right. So in terms of the new precedent, yes, thank you. Moving me along here. The next slide. There's my picture of Pandora's box. Um, uh, this did open a bit of a Pandora's box. And um, what that basically means is that CMS had never done this before. This is a these are this is a class of drugs. Um, exactly, Dr. Parker. Lecambi will it be administered in a limited way by a limited number and type of provider. Very true. Um, but it also opened the door for other types of therapies that the FDA might approve in the future, not just in Alzheimer's disease, but in other disease areas. 
Uh, it also challenges this accelerated approval pathway that's used. Most of the time it, it, in more recent years, it's been used in oncology and cancer uh, therapies, but also in a lot of rare diseases. Um, and in infectious disease, it started in use for HIV AIDS back in 1992. That's when Congress passed a statute creating the Accelerated Approval Program. And it's thanks to advocates in the HIV AIDS community that we have that program today. Um, these drugs are covered under Part B in Medicare. A lot of you have heard of Medicare Part A, Part B. Um, these are covered under Part B. They're not Part D drugs. Those are the ones that you get at the pharmacy, right? Part B drugs are ones that you get at either a doctor's office or an outpatient center at a hospital, like where someone with cancer would get chemotherapy. And CMS had never done this before, to refuse to cover a drug for its FDA-approved medically accepted use or denied coverage for an entire class of drugs um, where clinical trials aren't even completed yet. And that's what happened with Lakembi. Those clinical trials weren't completed, but they had already kind of, you know, judge and jury uh, made a, a decision about what would happen to coverage for that drug. I see another question here. Um, do those doing the studies physically going to, rather than depending on digital and visually, I learned that my conclusions when I was physically present. Oh, that's a great question. How the research is going to be conducted. And I think that that was the question that I have. But based on what you're saying, people are going to be in a research study for an indefinite period of time for these drugs. And we still don't know the outcome of several drugs that have been in this holding pattern for greater than 2017 years, if I understood this correctly. So we haven't really sorted this all out, is what you're telling us, right? It's Correct. Not clear who's going to be giving these medications, where they're going to be giving it, right? Right. And as I mentioned before, it's in in some ways it's because CMS hasn't yet defined, you know, what do they mean about the medical teams and the certain facilities that are capable of, you know, uh, tracking patients and conducting the studies, and they are purposefully a bit opaque about it. Uh, as a way to confuse. And there are infusion centers, for example, that have wanted to start providing these medications. And those types of centers tend to be located in more uh, rural and remote areas rather than having to be attached to a hospital. Some of them are attached to hospitals, but not all of them. And there's been some confusion. So they've been more apt to take patients that are able to pay fully out of pocket than to try to go through the Medicare process that's available right now, because some of these questions are still hanging out there, still open. Thank you for these great, these are great questions. Um, okay, next slide. Um, oh, whoops, I think, uh, go back one, please. Um, I, the other things, and this is just really uh, quick, is that they're effectively second-guessing FDA's expert judgment. Um, coverage with evidence development is not in federal law, like I talked about, accelerated approval is, so Congress did not create it. CMS just created it on its own. Um, and let's let's move on, because I see I'm sort of pushing time here. One um, who does this really benefit, all this hedging? It, it doesn't seem like it really helps the patients who need the medicine. It doesn't. It helps the Medicare program. And there are um, certain, you know, um, uh, there are groups who are supportive of trying to cut costs in the Medicare program. The thing is, is we have had a lot of people aging. We probably had the biggest population shift into the Medicare program in the last uh, 12 years than we've ever had. And it's about 20, 20 million uh, people have enrolled, which is a huge amount of enrollees, and it substantially increased the costs. And instead of us having a social dialogue about what we need to do to support our aging population, a lot of what is happening, and it's happening in different administrations, um, is there's a lot of talk about how do you slash and burn costs, and this is one way to do it. So that's what we're looking at. Um, and again, you know, this is just, like I said, devices, medical procedures, that's primarily where CED used, uh, was used. 
Um, and there was only one that was used on a drug before it was it's something for colorectal cancer, uh, for off-label use of anti-cancer chemotherapy drugs. Um, and that was back in 2005. Um, next slide. Uh, the first time that CMS tried to do this, can um, we get, get to the next one? Next slide, please. Uh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Um, uh, the, this was attempted back in 2019 for a type of cancer drugs called CAR T drugs um, in 2019. But the cancer community was really well organized, and a lot of community cancer centers pushed back really hard on CMS. And they, and and CMS came up with a rationale for why they decided not to put it under the CED. So organizing um, actually really does help. Like this goes back to my point that these are very political. They're, it's not really kind of based in like there's not enough evidence per se. It's uh, political decision making. Next slide. Uh, potential impacts on access. I've talked a bit about this throughout, so I'll just go through this quickly. Um, you know, there's a lot of cumbersome data collection. A lot of times that's, you know, a barrier in and of itself. Doctors just don't want to deal with it. Um, in some times with some of these CEDs, the, the hospitals have to pay a fee to participate in a registry. Um, there can be delays. Uh, uh, utilization tends to be significantly lower in less wealthy areas and communities of color and rural areas. And there have been studies that have showed this. Um, so we push back pretty hard on these types of decisions. And especially because Alzheimer's disease does disproportionately impact communities of color. People tend to be diagnosed later. I'm sure you guys all know this since you attend these Brain Talk Live conversations. So this is not a good decision uh, for a lot of people. Um, next uh, slide, please. Uh, again, more on restricted access, the cost time. There are ethical issues when it comes to the accelerated approval drugs. Why are you put in, potentially putting people on a placebo and when they're in Medicare, having Medicare pay for that type of a study is um, uh, really an ethical question that is um, up in the air right now, and we may be challenging the agency on this. Next um, slide, and I talked about this, I have talked about this with equity implications. Um, part of what we have uh, particularly been opposed to is when CMS tries to kind of re-up on some of these decisions It says there weren't enough people of color in this, this these terribly restrictive studies that they themselves designed. So then they'll say, we need to keep it going and try to get more people of color, and then that still doesn't happen. And so they've actually sort of used that issue of equity in a very negative way. Um, next uh, slide, does it ever end? Um, there have been some that have ended. They're supposed to end these after 10 years. They're supposed to relook at them. Uh, but the, reopening them in and of itself is like another nine to 12 month process, so it takes a while. Next slide. Um, there's, as I mentioned before, push to get brighter, uh, broader use of CED, not just in this um, uh, example. And if you see this article, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is actually an advisor to CMS who said, uh, you know, was this a one-off? Uh, Aducanumab is um, uh, the non-name brand for Aduhelm. Is it a one-off or a pragmatic path forward, a way to save costs in the program moving forward? Next slide. Um, PET scans have been under CED for about 10 years, but that is changing, thankfully, uh, probably actually by next week. Um, originally in 2013, Medicare decided to limit coverage of AB PET scans. Um, saying that there wasn't enough evidence and actually talking about how there weren't disease modifying therapies to change the course of the disease. So you basically had three options. You could either pay for the scans out of pocket, you could just say you're not getting it, or you could enroll in these limited clinical trials, but there's no active trials going on. So unless you can pay out of pocket right now, you can't you can't get one. And, and uh, on top of it, Medicare said you can only get one per beneficiary in your whole life. So with these new drugs that, you know, require some monitoring, you don't always need a PET scan, but uh, to, to find out whether you're appropriate for them and see if they're working or not, one's not going to cut it. Next slide. 
uh, data that was collected published back in 2019. So it's been four years since that data was published, showed that it was effective, changed the course uh, in 60% of the cases. That's incredible, incredibly helpful. Uh, they did this equity thing that I mentioned before. Oh, not enough people of color participated. Got to do it again. But it was so abysmal. Uh, because they had set up such barriers that they weren't really getting any enrollment at all. And we pushed a lot at the community. By we, I mean the community. We worked a lot. Next slide. And I'm, I'm, I'm not self-congratulating. I'm, I'm, I'm giving a high five to all the groups um, that we worked with over the last several years. Uh, many of them, we followed their lead. We went to Medicare. We went to President Biden. Um, and in July of this year, CMS proposed to end the CED, expand it, and the one scan per beneficiary per lifetime. Again, like I said, we're probably going to be seeing this next uh, week. Next slide. Here's collaboration of all the different groups that worked on this together. Uh, here's some uh, efforts that we did as a rally. Uh, right across from HHS, you got to be loud and proud about this stuff. Talk about how people living with Alzheimer's count that they deserve to have uh, their treatment and care covered, and um, you know, let's make a change together. So, I really appreciate you having me here, and I'm totally, you know, any questions that you might have either today or if you want to send me an email, I'd love to hear from you. And, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much, Ms. Peston. We really learned a lot. I learned a lot. And one of the things that I think is most hopeful about everything that you said is that at least sometime in the near future, people will be able to get an A beta PET scan for determining whether or not they have Alzheimer's. And for those of us who may be language challenged or other things, getting Medicare approval for a PET scan would save a lot of us a lot of aggravation trying to figure out what kind of dementia we have. Um, so that was extremely helpful. And um, thank you for educating us about what lobbying efforts are still necessary. I think most of us didn't know that we were taking drugs or drugs were still under some kind of investigation that we weren't knowledgeable about, certainly cancer. So I thank you. Um, we will have um, in the next couple of weeks um, our Brain Health Forum at the Carter Center. And with all the information that you presented today, I'm hoping we'll have more information about how this medication is going to be administered and distributed, certainly in the state of Georgia, but anybody else for any other state. It seems like it's a very conditional uh, approval. 